like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that we all work, live and play on, both in Australia and internationally. I just recognise the continuing connections that we have to waters, land and culture and pay respects to elders past and present. We here in Australia acknowledge the gift of wisdom that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples continue to generously share with us. And um, we'd like to just, I'd just like to also acknowledge um, my own Gamilaroi ancestors that came before us today. So we're here today as part of the Emancipatory Dialogue Project that um, Donna Baines and myself are members of. And we are very honoured to have um, the directors of Corajo, Belinda Kendall and Tina McGee, to be here with us. And I will let them introduce themselves a little bit as well. I'm Belle Kendall. I'm a Barkindji Waramai Wailworm Wiradjuri woman from New South Wales. I'm down sitting on Wiradjuri country in southern New South Wales and I'm the co-CEO of Karajo. Tina McGee and I'm a Wiradjuri Ngunnawal woman born and raised on the beautiful Darawa country here in the Illawarra and um, I'm co-CEO at Karajo and pleased to be here today. Thank you. I'm Donna <laughs> Beans. Um, I'm a white woman who's working, living and playing on the unceded, occupied, ancestral and traditional lands of the Musqueam people in Vancouver, BC. And I'm located, located on Jinnaburra country myself today as well. We're moving beyond the current system and we're looking at how we authentically adapt mm -hmm. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander mm -hmm. visions and approaches um, to the Western constructs that are here already to get the best of both in some ways, and then a lot of conversation around connection, visioning, leadership, education, self-determination, sovereignty, uh, all for our peoples. I know I've heard you speak very articulately in the past, and you did a little bit today about working in two worlds. Could you could you just speak a little bit more about that, the challenges there? And, and I think that is at the heart of the work that we do, and probably one of the easiest examples I can give is that, um, you know, we're not separate to our communities or our countries in which we live or we work. Um, we're part of that and it is part of us. Um, and and I think in lots of ways, uh, non-Aboriginal organisations often will either create a position or create a project and, uh, you know, we're going to employ this Aboriginal person and we're going to do these things. Um, you know, when it comes down to it, um, we have to look at those things as well. Like we have people that are very, very, um, uh, they're, they're in a, uh, find the right word, they're in a position in their community where they have a lot of um, rights and responsibilities and obligations. Um, so that just doesn't mean that if there's sorry business, they might be away. If there's something that's happening in their community, they're at the heart of that. They're going to be feeling that. They're going to be affected by that, you know, good, bad or otherwise. So it's a little bit like sometimes you hear, and, and, and Bill and I know when, when we're, you know, recruiting, that if you're recruiting, for example, a countryman or someone that's very connected to uh, their community and has those roles and responsibilities, that then means that they have other obligations that they have to adhere to as well. And so sometimes we see, you know, where uh, people have either employed Aboriginal people or um, created projects, but then been put off by the fact that they've got so many other obligations that they need to. Um, so in one hand, it's a little bit about wanting the richness that that person brings and their culture and their all of the, you know, amazing um, <clears throat> And when I say amazing, it's just hard to articulate in words what um, that actually looks like because it's really not just what it looks like physically. It's the emotional side and the spiritual and um, those connections and how a person makes you feel and what, what they can do. But if they've got those obligations in community, we know when we employ those people that we have to work with that. Um, so it, it's not about we don't view that as, oh, that person's had another day off because... They've got another funeral to go to. They've got obligations um, that they need to um, fulfil. So, um, and, and we don't find that it impacts on our workload because, again, the environment that's created uh, by all staff, not by Bell and I, by, by all staff, um, supports that. That's great. Anything, Belinda, would you add? Or? Um, I just think, you know, exactly what, 
Tina said, you're constantly navigating the Western world and the Aboriginal world, and especially around values. So I find there is conflict at times um, that we do have to navigate and around, you know, in how people work and, you know, how people see the world. We all see the world a little bit um, differently. And as Aboriginal peoples, we are also all very, um, very diverse but I do think, you know, there are certain policies and legislation in place that are in conflict with, you know, Aboriginal ways of um, knowing, doing and being and having the skills to navigate that. But what I think works is that we are a collective. So we have a support, a web around us to support us while we're doing that. We're able to bounce you know, things are Tina and I consistently have conversations every single day and with our leadership team, with our whole team around, you know, where there might be a road bump. That's probably a nice way to put it, where there might mm. be a little road bump and how we will navigate that to move forward. And then we draw on strengths again. So, mm. you know, but it's quite often that Tina and I and the rest of the leadership team will say, okay, I'll be the one to have that conversation or you should be the one to have that conversation. There's that relationship or there's that knowledge. So it's it's a constant weaving, I suppose, mm -hmm. a weaving of, you know, the team um, <clears throat> to be able to support navigating those two worlds. But I think one, one big thing around, you know, Aboriginal people is that we want to share. Mm -hmm. So that sharing needs to be accepted, but it needs to be treated with dignity. And it needs to be valued. Yeah. In my mind, um, the whole idea of these discussions is for us to think about um, our responsibility in the space yeah. to decolonise and to continue to have these, we call it emancipatory dialogue, but what we mean is yarns, mm -hmm. <laughs> to, in order to look at, you know, possible reconciliation, but also look at how we can actually make these changes in the world and how we can actually start to listen to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, that leadership from the field to come back mm -hmm. into all sorts of different places like academia, but also yep. organisations themselves. So mm -hmm. really that's what the project has been about. I mean, we've been so lucky to to find you, but how do we authentically liberate Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and Indigenous peoples across the world and, and get move beyond these systems that are literally killing them that's what towards social justice and equity that's really what the project is for excellent well put well put um uh, yes and i think it's it's also worth noting that we we wanted to as part of decolonizing our research project was to have um a, a, um, a component in our findings that was oral tradition so thank you to um bell and to tina today to for participating in this this oral tradition of um, yarning um, and and sharing our thoughts and our stories um, with the outside world, so thank you very much. Really appreciate it.